Okay, my name is Sandy Sprunger, and I am a retail pharmacist with IU Health. I've been here for about 14 years. Um, the last couple of years, I have been over at Ball State Pharmacy um, at the health center on campus. Have a lot of experience with some of these oral contraceptives and so forth. Um, I also work at Yorktown Pharmacy over in Yorktown, and today I'm at Pavilion. So I'm kind of all over. So if you need anything, let me know. We're going to jump right in. Um, we do kind of have a lot to cover. If you guys have questions, just ask. I don't know exactly what all you're wanting. I have this presentation that I put together um, in March for the internal medicine residents. But really, if you have any specific questions, don't hesitate to stop me. We're basically just going to go over different options and all of that kind of stuff. So we'll jump right in. Um, a real fast reminder, this is obviously, we're not going into the mechanism of action of all of this kind of stuff. You could, it could take forever. Um, the hypothalamus secretes gonadotropin releasing hormone, which works on the anterior pituitary to stimulate um, the release of follicle stimulating hormone, FSH and LH. The FSH and the LH are responsible for the development and release of a mature ovum. So when we're talking about contraception um, with hormones, we have estrogens and progestins. Our estrogens work by preventing the formation of a follicle. It creates um, a negative feedback loop between the hypothalamus and the pituitary, preventing that release of the FSH. So you're providing estrogen, you're not gonna get the FSH, no um, ovulation. The progestins inhibit the estrogen-induced LH surge. No LH surge, then um, again, you're not gonna get ovulation. Progestins also cause thickening of cervical mucus, which make it difficult for sperm to enter the uterus. And there are, um, are changes in the endometrium that progestin causes, like a thinning and really just an overall unwelcoming environment for implantation. So moving into combination hormonal contraceptives. The primary mechanism is to prevent ovulation. And we do that, like I said, by suppressing the FSH and the LH hormones. Um, we can combine estrogens and progestins, and those together really do provide a synergistic effect in preventing ovulation. Now, you can give just progestins alone, um, but you actually are more likely to ovulate with a progestin-only contraceptive. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit later. So our estrogens, the one you're gonna probably see most of the time, ethanyl estradiol, and is the most common. It's the one that's most studied. It ranges in dose from 10 to 50 micrograms. Um, there is an estradiol valerate. This was kind of put on the market. Um, it, it's naturally um, occurring, or it's converted to a naturally occurring form of estradiol in the body. It was originally thought that maybe this would produce less side effects, but that really hasn't been shown. So it's still, it's not real common. Now our progestin, this is where it gets kind of tricky. If you've had any experience with birth controls, there are a million different progestins. Um, they differ in kind of their affinity for the androgen and the glucocorticoid receptors. So when you look at this chart, there's different generations. The first ones that came out, um, you got the norethinadrone, um, the ethanolol diacetate. Anyway, the first generation um, progestins, you will actually kind of see more breakthrough bleeding. Um, so you start a patient on one of these, they might have some spotting, some breakthrough bleeding. Well, then we developed the second generation, and um, they have a higher affinity for that progestin receptor, which is great. You get less breakthrough bleeding, but it also has a higher affinity for the androgen receptors. So in this generation, the norgesterone, the levonorgesterone, you can potentially see increased androgenic side effects. That's your acne, your weight gain, your hirsutism, um, increased lipid levels, that kind of thing. So that's our second generation. Third generation was made, and these actually have less androgenic side effects, which is really beneficial. You have the norgestimate and the desogesterone. And then you have these whole other class of synthetic progestin. And a lot of these in this other class are more of an anti-androgenic 
And so a lot of these have been marketed and will help with people that actually have acne. So it can help with anti-androgenic side effects, acne, weight gain, that kind of thing. So I can make this available to you. It's kind of helpful to see them broken down into the different generations, something that you'll want to think about later on when we discuss um, the different combinations. All right, so there are a gazillion forms of birth control. You should be able to find something that your patient likes. Um, we have oral, transdermal, intravaginal, intramuscular, subcutaneous, and intrauterine. And we're going to kind of jump into each of those. Uh, first things first, the combined oral contraceptive, COCs. That's combining your estrogen and your progestins. Um, most of these are in tablet form. There is a capsule available, even some chewables. Um, most of them are monophasic. And so what that means is you have the same amount of hormone for the first 21 days. Um, whether it's estrogen and progestin, um, that dose does not change over the course of 21 days. That's typically followed by a seven-day hormone-free or a placebo pill. And that's when your withdrawal bleeding will happen and, the, and your patient will have a period. Um, these were the very first ones put out on the market and they were put together to mimic a regular um, cycle for women, that they would have a cycle once a month. Um, after that, different phases were developed. So we have triphasic, biphasic. What that means is the amount of hormone can change from week to week. An example, you may have heard of trisprintec. And so the first week you have a hormone, um, the progestin is the lowest, the second week it bumps up a little bit more, and the third week it bumps up even further. So it's triphasic, it changes three different times. Um, that was developed secondly to maybe even better mimic a woman's cycle. Um, again, they thought maybe this would help with side effects. Um, that really hasn't been proven either. You can still have the side effects. So there really is no physiologic need to actually have withdrawal bleeding or for a woman to have a period every month. And so then we developed these extended cycles. Um, these are great for women that just don't want to have a period every month, um, people that have painful periods. Um, we use them for all different types of things. But um, really, you would take active tablet for 12 weeks and then have a week of hormone free. And that again is when you would have your withdrawal bleeding and the woman would have a period. So basically having one period every three months. Um, an example of this of an extended cycle would be seasonal. It has 84 days of hormone, um, 30 micrograms of ethanol estradiol and 150 micrograms of the levonorgestrel. That is a second generation uh, progestin. It is then followed by seven inactive tablets or placebo tablets. Um, and again, you'd have your period every three months. Um, if you decide to go this route with your patient, you would want to let them know it does take a good several cycles to kind of balance out. Um, and so you may at first see um, spotting and breakthrough bleeding in the first couple months and even first couple cycles before the body can kind of get used to that. Um, another example of this is Seasonique. And this one's a little bit different. It is almost exactly like season L as far as it has the same dose for 84 days. But during that seven um, week period that you do not have active tablets with season L, season E has a really small dose of estrogen, um, 10 micrograms. And so on season E, you are actually giving the patient all active tablets. The reason they're doing this is because some women really have a hard time with that week that they're having withdrawal bleeding. Um, they go from having all of these hormones to having nothing during that seven days, and they have a lot of cramping and bloating and headache. Um, the benefit for doing a small amount of estrogen is to help with these women who are really sensitive to that placebo week. Um, but it's important to tell your patient, don't skip that week. Um, obviously, if you're giving them that for a reason, you don't want them to just throw them away. Continuous cycles are really similar to extended cycles. Um, extended cycles like the seasonal and the seasonic are actually packaged. There are 84 tablets plus a placebo, 91 tablets in a package that I would give from my pharmacy. Some insurance plans do not pay for those. Some of them require prior authorizations. So we can kind of get the same benefit with a continuous cycle. Basically, you're using regular packages. Some of them are 
um, packaged with only 21 tablets without the last week of placebo. Um, you can continuously take that. Um, you could do that for three cycles and then just tell your patient to have a period. Or again, there's really no reason that they would need to have a period. Um, or the nice thing about this is let's say you have a patient that has a wedding coming up or a major vacation to Hawaii and they don't wanna be on their period. If they are on a multiphasic, um, it works best with multiphasic birth control, they could take their three weeks, skip the placebo and automatically start the next tablet, therefore skipping their period. They may have some spotting, but they probably won't have a heavy period like normal. Um, so continuous cycle. If you decide that you want to do an extended cycle for a patient regularly because their insurance won't pay for season out, you can write a prescription. Example, Orthonova 135. Um, it's normally a 28-day pack. You would want to make sure you would write on the prescription, patient skipping, placebo week, taking continuously. That way they don't go to the pharmacy and run into issues with insurance. Oh, I can't get this filled. They say it's too soon that kind of thing. Um, okay, advantages of oral contraceptives. All of them can really help with menstrual irregularity. They can prevent benign breast disease and pelvic inflammatory disease, prevent ectopic pregnancies, reduce functional cysts, um, can improve acne. A lot of them, even if it's not in that other category, can still help improve acne. Um, but the main thing is these are budget friendly. If you have a patient that needs birth control and cost is an issue. Most of them are covered at zero charge with insurance plans. I know, over, I know over on campus, we have several options that are only $12 a month for students. Um, it makes it cost effective. We wanna make sure that they're not getting pregnant if they don't want to. So that is kind of the main selling point for tablets. Disadvantages, you're taking an oral tablet, you get some nausea, breast tenderness, maybe some breakthrough bleeding, depending on your progestin. Um, amenorrhea, they may stop having periods. Um, could be an advantage, could be a disadvantage. It kind of depends on your patient. Some women do like to have regular periods because it reassures them that they're not pregnant. Um, I think most people would be okay with not having a period, but um, daily administration, it could be a compliance thing. If you have someone that cannot remember to take a tablet every day, this is probably not for them. Um, if you skip more than a few tablets, you really could ovulate and have an issue. And we'll talk about that in, the, in a few slides. Um, combined oral contraceptives have the estrogen. And as you guys know, estrogen can put us at higher risk for venous thrombosis. Um, people that are even higher risk for the venous thrombosis smokers, uh, people that have high lipids, uh, severe diabetes, consistently elevated blood pressure, and even obesity. So all things to kind of think about. Um, hypertension, we do wanna make sure that our patients have regular blood pressure checks. Um, most of the estrogen in today's doses are pretty low or aren't going to affect it like they used to be, but you still wanna, you still wanna monitor that regularly. Okay, this slide I can also make available to you. It's pretty helpful when you're looking at, okay, I, I started this person on this tablet and she's having breakthrough bleeding. Like, what do I do? How do I change this? Um, this goes through and talks about, oh, if I have too much estrogen, patients may experience nausea, breast tenderness, headache, increased blood pressure. Maybe we need to back it down to something with a lower estrogen content. If you have a patient that has spotting or breakthrough bleeding in the early to mid cycle, maybe you don't have enough um, estrogen and we want to bump it up. Maybe we started them on something low and we need to give them more estrogen. Um, the progestin, breast tenderness, headache, food, mood changes, that could mean maybe you have a product that has too much estrogen. I'm sorry, too much progestin. Um, if they are breakthrough bleeding late in the cycle, it could mean that they have too little progestin. Um, again, it's, it's kind of an art because you also have the four classes of progestin. So you may need to just pick something and start it with your patient. Um, androgen, we touch base on some of those, the second generation, um, they kind of hit some of these androgen receptors. And so you might have a patient that maybe didn't have any issues with acne before, complaining about acne, 
um, maybe some hirsutism, weight gain, and we may need to just move to a different progestin altogether. Um, I want, I didn't really know else to put this, so I, I threw this in here, brand versus generic. Um, if you've had any experience with this, there are a thousand different brands for the same product. Um, it is often determined, like the patient gets basically what their insurance pays for. They may not pay for 12 different brands of Sprintec, but they may pay for Sprintec. Um, it may also be contracted through the pharmacy, their wholesaler. They may get, you know, the flavor of the month, what's contracted. Um, FDA does consider generic and brand to be um, equivalent and interchangeable if they can pro provide pharmaceutical equivalents. They do that by demonstrating that the rate and extent of absorption is not substantially different. So they don't have to prove that is the exact same but that the absorption and rate aren't substantially different. Obviously it has to have the same ingredient, the same strength, that kind of thing. Um, with this being said in my own practice over at Ball State on campus, I mean, we are constantly transferring things back and forth when students come to school, we're transferring them. Oh, you gave me something different. Um, all of a sudden I'm having this headache. You know, I really need to have this other brand. For the most part, we honor that. Um, it is thought by the ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, they do support patient and clinical requests for a certain brand um, and to continue on the same thing if, it, if the patient would like it. And I think a lot of that is because patient compliance. Um, if the patient thinks they're getting a headache with this medication, are they really? I don't know. I'm kind of skeptical. But I mean, if the package is different, if they think it's different, maybe they're not going to take it. And who knows, they might ovulate and get pregnant. Um, I don't really want that on my watch. So it's easier just to give it if they want it. Um, but you may have a patient that for whatever reason might have a sensitivity to an inactive ingredient. Who knows? Just a reminder, though, if you have a patient saying, well, I was fine. I went to this pharmacy, they switched me, I asked them to switch and they said they don't have it. You can write a prescription for a specific brand, even if it's not the name brand, but make sure you're signing that as a, as a dispense is written one, so the pharmacy will not change it. Um, if they don't carry that brand, the patient may have to go somewhere else. Um, most pharmacies I've been in have a whole wall of all the million different ingredients, so just a side note. Okay, moving on to progestin only pills. We call these the mini pills a lot. Um, the first one is the Northenadrone, 0.35 milligrams, goes under the name of Erin, Camilla, Orthomicronor. Um, this is only a progestin. Um, it's important to note that when you have a pack of this, all of the tablets are active. Every single one has Northenadrone, 0.35. This can be confusing for some patients that have been on other birth controls before and always thrown out the last week. Um, they maybe don't take the placebo pills. If you have a patient that is skipping the last week of this, they very well could ovulate and get pregnant. Um, these are not widely used as sole birth control methods um, because you do not have that estrogen like we talked about earlier you are more likely to ovulate without that estrogen. You don't have that synergistic effect. Norfinadrone also has um, a smaller half-life. And so it is very important and crucial that if you have a patient on this, they really need to take it every single day at the same time, every single day. If they vary that for more than three hours, I mean, you think that's not very long, took it normally at seven and already it's 11 o'clock, they really need to have a backup method. Greater than three hours, they could potentially ovulate. Um, and so you would want to use a backup method for the next 48 hours, um, which is kind of a bum deal. <laughs> um, a second option for progestin only, I don't see this one as frequently, but it is out there. Drospirinone, four milligram. It goes by the name Slind. Um, it, it does have a longer half-life than the norfinadrone. So it's not quite as imperative, the over three hours you need to use backup. Um, and it is a little bit different. It has 24 days of active tablet and then four days of placebo. 
So where the Northgunner drone had all active tablet, this does have four days of placebo. Um, they still recommend if you would miss a whole tablet, um, like a whole day, that you would maybe use backup for seven days. So you have a little bit more wiggle room. Again, I don't really see this one as frequent. I'm not sure why. Advantages, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I will get to that. Okay. Um, I will have to look. I have a slide about migraines with Aura. So remind me when we get there. <laughs> um, advantages, great for breastfeeding in women. Obviously they don't have the estrogen, so we don't have to worry about the thromboembolism. embolism. That's the main reason probably why we're using these. Um, decreased dysmenorrhea, which would be good. So painful menstruation, a lot of times that reduces that, reduces um, menstrual blood loss. Some women don't have the periods if they're taking the North and drone constantly. So maybe remind your breastfeeding mothers that they could potentially, you know, get pregnant. And so this would be a good option. Um, I mean, not taking anything, they could potentially get pregnant while they're breastfeeding. And so this might be a good option for them. Um, it helps with decreasing PMS. Disadvantages, obviously compliance is huge. Um, if you think about your own life, how often are you at home at the same time every day to take a pill? Um, kind of a bum deal again to, to remember to do it. But unscheduled bleeding, North and a drone um, is a first generation. I have to double check, I think. But you can get some spotting. So that can kind of be bothersome for people. Um, again, the amenorrhea benefit, disadvantage, depends on your patient. Transdermal, we do have patches. Now these are a combination. It has estrogen and progestin. The patch is applied and worn for seven days and you do that consistently for three weeks. Um, on day 22 or going into the fourth week, you would take the patch off and you would have a hormone-free week. Um, that's when you would normally have your withdrawal bleeding and your period. You would start a new cycle after that seven, di after that seven days and you would apply a new patch. These patches go on the upper arm, the stomach, the buttocks, really anywhere where tight fitting clothing is not gonna rub it. Um, you just don't want it rubbed by a bra strap or um, a waistline or something where, where clothing is gonna bother it. Um, and you do wanna rotate sites, maybe you know on one arm one week, another arm the next week on the back um, because you can have some irritation with the adhesive. And so that will kind of help prevent irritation. Um, there are two different patches, the Zulane, um, Ethanol Estradiol 35, nor just Stramon, I can't even say it, <laughs> um, 150 micrograms. Um, this one's been around for a while, it's generic. Um, it is important to note that it is actually less effective in women that weigh over 198 pounds. Again, we'll kind of briefly mention obesity in a little bit, but maybe not as effective in, in women over that. The new one out on the market, I think it came out last year maybe, I haven't even seen this in practice, the Twirl Up. Um, it has a little bit less estrogen, um, a different progestin. It also carries um, kind of a weight issue with that. Um, it has reduced effectiveness with a BMI between 25 and 30, and it's actually contraindicated in women over a BMI of 30. Advantages? greater compliance. Just slap that baby on and you're good for a week. You don't have to worry about being home at 10 o'clock every night to take your pill. Um, it does have decreased side effects. Um, you are bypassing that whole first pass metabolism that you get with oral tablets. So you don't have the nausea and vomiting, which is great. Um, most people get used to that with the oral tablets, but you don't have that. Um, disadvantages, obviously weight consideration, skin irritations, um, what happens if it falls off unnoticed? Um, if you have a patch that is off for longer than 48 hours, it could be problematic. You would need to use backup method and so forth. Um, and I have a, a slide about that. Now there is kind of a theoretical issue with this. You can potentially get higher steady state concentrations with the patch. And if you think about a tablet, you take a tablet every day and then it start, the amount in the body starts to decrease. And then you take it again and you kind of get curves like a wave, so to speak. Um, with a patch, you have that steady state in your body all week. And so you potentially are getting greater concentrations of estrogen 
with the patch. So may not be the best option for your smokers and your high risk patients that have issues with the estrogen. Um, the next one is the vaginal ring. Um, it's a flexible ring um, that you do insert vaginally. Hormones are released slowly. Again, you have both estrogen and progestin, and they are absorbed directly by the reproductive organs. So it's kind of right where it needs to be. Um, you insert it, you leave it in for three weeks, and then you take it out. You have one week when you're not have a ring in. And again, that's where you have your withdrawal bleeding and your period. Um, and there are actually two products out in the market. The most common one is the Nuva Ring, generic, been around for a little while. Um, and it does have a really low amount of estrogen, 15 micrograms. Um, and the Etogesterol 120 is, is actually an active metabolite of Desogesterol, which is a third generation um, progestin. Now you would use a new ring every month. So after those three weeks, you would dispose of it, call up your pharmacy, get a new ring for the next week. Um, if it would fall out sometime, you can take it, rewash it, um, insert it, and you would be fine. If it is out for longer than three hours, you may need to use a backup method, and we'll get to that shortly. Now, the Nuva Ring is um, stored in the fridge, which is kind of weird, but it can be stored at room temperature for up to four months. So I always get girls calling me, I'm going on vacation next week. Do I have to put a, you know, put this in a cooler and take it with me? No, you're fine. Um, the new one on the market, and I have yet to see this, and it's really an interesting concept. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, the Anovera. Um, it is really the same thing as the Nuva Ring as far as you insert, leave it in for three weeks, remove it, have a period, um, but you use the same ring for the whole year. Um, it would be convenient, I guess, not to have to go to the pharmacy. I mean, you, the patient has the ring at their fingertips for a whole year. Um, once it's removed, you obviously wash it with um, water and soap, and then you store it in a case, and then you have your period for the week, and then you would reinsert the same ring. Now, looking at this, it was really expensive. The cash price was like $2,500, but that's a whole year's worth of birth control. Um, my retail brain is kind of thinking, okay, insurances aren't gonna pay for this. What happens if my college student, you know, leaves it at home, how, you know, or they lose it between moving, like how are they gonna replace it? I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if it catches on. I haven't seen it yet, but it's there. Um, advantages, they're highly effective because again, they're, um, they're going right to those reproductive organs and they do result in complete suppression of ovulation and exceptional cycle control. Um, it does have the lowest dose of estrogen compared to other CHCs. There's no nausea and vomiting because you're eliminating that first pass effect like you have with tablets. Disadvantages, it can cause some headaches. Some vaginal irritation, which you might expect if you're inserting it, maybe some discharge. Um, the ring could potentially slip during intercourse, um, or you or your partner could potentially feel it during intercourse, and that may be bothersome for people. Um, patients worry about it falling out, but honestly, in the literature, um, it not only happens in about 5% of patients. It doesn't normally fall out, but again, you can rinse and reinsert. Yes. Just a question about yeah. that. Um, so you said that if it's out for more than three hours, that's when you would um, come back and Yes. Do you have an advice for patients who might say they're uncomfortable during intercourse, but they can just, like, as long as it's not for more than three hours? I, I haven't really ever, I mean, nobody ever asked me that, okay. probably because they're like, oh, I don't want to talk about intercourse. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure it's fine. I mean, if we're realistic, it probably wouldn't be very long. Um, but I still wouldn't make it a good habit. Um, if it's bothersome for them, I would probably maybe try to find something else. Um, again, I don't know how common it is. I haven't had a lot. I mean, I've had a lot of people use the ring, but not a lot of people. I don't think I've ever had anybody tell me it's bothersome or they felt it during intercourse. But it's not normally something you just talk to your retail pharmacist about. But I mean, that's a great point. Um, I don't know why you couldn't, as long as it's 
within the appropriate amount of time. But I almost would lean towards finding something else. So that's a good question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I don't see that as frequently. Um, I don't know why you couldn't because you're not changing the amount. Um, so whenever you're skipping on those extended cycles, it doesn't work as well with like a triphasic and some of those others. These are not those. They are monophasic. You keep them the same. Um, you probably could. In reality, I don't see it a lot, but I don't know why you couldn't. Um, I would think that would be fine. Again, you don't, you know, having the periods aren't necessary. So it may be an issue. Um, I know for a fact that we, we do a lot of the tablets where they skip the placebo week and insurances will pay, you know, 21, 28 tablets for 21 days is essentially how you run it with insurance. I don't know if insurances would pay, you know, three patches for 21 weeks. You can try it. Um, you may get policy and the insurance will pay for it. And unfortunately, that dictates a lot. Yeah. Um, not, I didn't see a lot of that. Um, right. It does kind of make sense that maybe, you know, you would have an issue with an STI. Um, I do know that when we're talking, well, I'm going to talk about IUDs real quick. Um, that used to be a big concern, and it's kind of gone away as well. So I don't, I don't think it's as big of a deal now. If you have someone, you know, with pelvic inflammatory disease or like major issues, it may not even be comfortable wearing it. Um, so again, I, I don't know for sure, but. I, right? I know. The year long one is really awkward for me. I know I haven't done a lot of research on it. It just came out. I, I don't, I can't see that catching on. But yeah, it, it seems kind of awkward. Right, right. Move on. Um, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. But anyone else? Okay. Um, obviously, advantages of the ring you're inserting that, you forget about it for three weeks, you remove it. Great for compliance. Um, I think I talked about disadvantages. All right. Okay, IM injection, intramuscular, the depo primera. That's the depo medroxy progesterone acetate, DMPA. Um, that's a synthetic progestin injection every three months, usually in the deltoid or the gluteal muscle. It actually he achieves a high concentration of progestin compared to just taking the oral tablets. Um, and so it's actually very efficacious. Even though you're not using the estrogen with the whole synergistic effect thing, um, it's very efficacious because you are getting such high concentrations of progestin. Advantages, you don't have to worry about the weight thing with this. So a lot of patients that are obese um, may want to use something like this. Other interactions with drugs don't matter. Um, dysmenorrhea is decreased. Some people stop having periods. Um, it is safe for breastfeeding mothers. And again, it's every three months. All you have to do is go to the doctor every three months. It's way convenient. Disadvantage, oh, I have to make an office appointment every three months. Um, it really depends on your patient. So um, I know on campus, it's really convenient because we will dispense the product and they go right upstairs to the women's center and they inject it and they go about their day. Um, we have a lot of people get the depo shot. Um, this really does persist in the body for a long time after discontinuing. I have a slide about that, but it will delay the return to fertility. So this may not be a great option if maybe someone's getting married and just wants like three months of birth control um, because it will delay when they're able to be fertile. Now, three months may not be a big deal, but if they've been on this for a long time, it can delay that return to fertility. And I'll talk about that in a minute. There is a black box warning on this, loss of bone mineral density, and it does seem to be um, greater with increased duration of use. And so we think it's because there is such a complete suppression of ovulation. Um, you also see less endogenous ovarian estrogen production, and estrogen does help protect the bones. And so um, you do wanna be cautious of that. Um, 
patients may be concerned about weight gain. I did read something that said the average weight gain is only five pounds in five years. I'm like, well, shoot, that's not too bad. So um, they do make this in a subcutaneous injection. I don't think I've ever dispensed it. Um, Depo Sub-Q Provera 104. It has 104 milligrams subcutaneously every three months. Um, you do that in the anterior thigh or in the abdomen. They, they still recommend this injection by healthcare professionals, but you could potentially train your patient if you feel like they're competent and will inject it correctly. So that might be more convenient. Um, it's not going to cause as much site pain because it's not going in the muscle, which is subcutaneous. Um, it is only available as a brand, so you might have an issue with it being covered by insurances. Um, and it still carries that bone loss, um, the black box warning for bone loss. Um, the implant, the next one on, um, this is a four centimeter long rod that's inserted subdermally under the skin in the inner upper arm. And you can leave this in place for up to three years. Advantages, it does not have estrogen. It is just an, um, a progestin. The longevity of it is amazing. So put it in and don't have to worry about it for three years. Um, it does have prompt um, return to fertility once it's removed. So that's a plus. I may not want to have kids right now, but in three years, who knows? Disadvantage, you have to have a minor surgical procedure. It can cause some menstrual irregularities, headache, breast tenderness, moodiness, some of that kind of stuff. Um, IUDs, there are two types, a copper IUD and the levonorgestrel. Um, they are T-shaped, inserted into the uterine cav cavity. Um, the copper IUD, it really just produces a really um, hostile environment for sperm. Um, and so it will reduce the formation um, of mature eggs. Now the levonorgestrel will help prevent ovulation, but it also thickens cervical mucus and it changes the endometrium. Now that um, you have Mirena, Lilita, both of those, um, and Kylina are good for up to five years. The Skyla has a lower amount of progestin and it is only good for three years. So advantages, there's really no systemic adverse effects. They're very safe. Um, menstrual blood loss, dysmenorrhea are decreased. Um, risk of endometrial and ovarian cancer is decreased. Complications are rare and they're safe in adolescence. And I, so I want to mention, they used to think, oh, STIs, um, increased risk of infection with these, but that's kind of gone by the wayside. Um, and we may even want to be thinking about these as first line for some of our patients. Um, you can leave it in for five years and don't have to worry about compliance. Um, it may be something you want to think about for the right patient. Um, amenorrhea um, occurs in half of women. They just stop having periods, and that would be a benefit. Disadvantage, um, you can get a lot of bleeding and spotting in the first six months. So if you're giving it to a patient saying, hey, this will help with your periods, and then they start having bleeding and spotting, they're going to think you're crazy. You may want to make sure that they know it's going to take a while for it to balance out. Um, expulsion of the IUD can occur. Usually that would happen in the first year of use. Um, cost may be a factor up front because obviously you have a small procedure. Um, but if you look at it in the course of five years and you take that cost divided by five years, it's actually the most cost effective. So, but if your patient doesn't have enough threat, that's not helpful. Um, it is contraindicated if you have abnormal or distorted uterine cavity, undiagnosed genital bleeding, and active cervical or endometrial infections. So you would want to make sure your patient does not have any current infections, and then you can place that. Um, efficacy rates, I want to go over this real fast. As you look over on the side, all the ones we just talked about with actual hormone, they're in the 90th percentile and up. Um, this chart kind of breaks it down into perfect use and typical use. Um, if everybody does it by the book, you know, 99% effective in all of them, uh, we all know our patients are not quite as compliant. Um, but even then, it's still 90% or above. If you're looking at the condoms, withdrawal method, I mean, gosh, 78% um, in typical use, that's not very good. So it just kind of shows you the effectiveness 
compared to all of them. Okay, return to fertility. Normally when we look at return to fertility, they are looking at the 12 month mark. So you stopped your birth control and how many people have gotten pregnant, that's one and two in 12 months. Um, the average time it takes for people to, to conceive is anywhere between six and 12 months after you stop. Um, as you look at the progestin only pills at 12 months, 95% of couples have conceived. So you can return to fertility pretty quickly. Um, oral contraceptives, anywhere between 72 and 94% at, at 12 months. IUDs, implants, all are kind of about the same. But look down there at the Provera. Uh, because of that high concentration, at 12 months, only you know 70%, up to 78% of people have been able to conceive. Um, I did read something that even said at 24 months, only 90% of people have been able to conceive. So the depo is great, maybe for our high school, college kids that are hopefully not having babies anytime soon, maybe not the best option for someone that's getting ready to start a family in a year. Okay, this is my slide about missed doses. Um, think about missed doses or missed, um, you know, something falls out or the patch comes off. A lot of times it depends on what week you are in your cycle. Every prescription that I dispense comes with a package insert for the patient. And I would really recommend our patients keeping them, but most of them throw them in the trash. <laughs> um, but it will tell you what to do if I have missed, you know, oh crap, I've missed two tablets in week three, what do I do? Um, as a general rule, that's what this slide is, kind of general guidelines. If you miss one tablet, take it as soon as possible. No, contracep no additional contraception needed. Two or more, you may you know, resume and use a backup for seven days. Um, two or more in weeks two and three, you may even need to discard the whole pack, start new, skip your placebo week, and go from there. I say it's general because of all of the different phases. A triphasic may be different than a monophasic. If you ever have questions, don't hesitate to call the pharmacy. Have your patient call them if they don't have a little package. I don't have all of these memorized. And so if I have someone that says, crap, I, I, I haven't had it for two days, I'll go pull the insert or pull it up on a reference. Okay, where are you in your cycle? And I look it up because it could vary. Um, the patch or the ring, again, if the patch is off for more than 48 hours or the ring is out for more than three hours, you may need to use another backup method. Um, you may need to eliminate that weak free, hormone free, depending on where you are in the cycle. And again, all of that would be spelled out. Um, we already talked about the progestin only pills. You need to make sure that's really consistent beyond three hours. You need to use backup for 48 hours. Um, obviously an injection, if they're beyond the 14 days um, and they couldn't make the appointment, you would want to test for pregnancy and then use a backup method for a week. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I think they recommend a week. Um, a lot of it kind of depends on where you are in the cycle. But yes, I think you would use a backup method for a week. Um, but if it's maybe in the last week you may ditch the whole thing, you would still want to use a week, but you may apply another patch. Anybody else? Okay, emergency contraception. Sorry, I'm running kind of late. Um, the most common one, we'll jump to that, is the plan B over the counter. It is a levonorgestrel. Um, it's a 1.5 milligram dose. That is a progestin. Um, its primary mechanism of action is to inhibit or delay ovulation. Um, and it also can impair sperm transport and inhibit fertilization in, with cervical mucus. Um, obviously, this is controversial. Kind of depends on the patient, um, kind of where they're defining pregnancy. Uh, it is not an abortion pill. If you are already pregnant or it has already implanted, it is not going to work. It really works um, before the LH surge has started. And so because of that, they only recommend this um, within 72 hours, three days of intercourse without protection. Um, and so if it's beyond that, the effectiveness goes way down. Um, 
within 24 hours, it can prevent 95% of pregnancies, but that drops all the way to 50% within 72 hours. And then it dips after that. Um, it also carries um, an issue with the weight and is not as effective in women that weigh over 154 pounds. Does not mean by any means that they shouldn't use it, um, but maybe just make sure they're realistic. Go ahead and use it, but it may not be as effective. Um, if they vomit in the first three hours of taking it, because it is such a large dose, I would suggest they would go get another one and repeat the dose. And if you're concerned about vomiting again, maybe have them get some meclizine, like anti-nausea, car sickness medication to take with it to try to help with that. They do have a prescription product, Ella or Eucrystalol. This does work differently. It's a selective progesterone modulator, receptor modulator. Um, it has agonist and antagonist properties at the progesterone site. What this does is it directly inhibits follicular development and the release of a mature ovum. So basically it delays ovulation. Um, it actually is more effective. It can, you can use this after the LH surge starts. So you can use this up to five days where the other one really is up to three days, but you need to write a prescription. It's not available over the counter. Um, and so the patient would have to call, but you do have a couple extra days. Um, it is more effective than levonorgestrel alone. Um, there is a theoretical concern if maybe they haven't been taking their birth control and then they, they get the Ella. You don't necessarily want to wait. You don't want them to start their birth control up right again because of that um, agonist antagonist property at the receptor. You usually want to wait five days. Um, so you would want to make sure they're protected for those five days before they start their birth control back up. Um, it also, it, it does help with the weight. It goes up to 80, 187 pounds, but it also is less effective in women who weigh over 187 pounds. Again, it doesn't mean that these women can't use this, but we want to be realistic with them and it may not be as effective. Um, the copper IUD is the most effective. Um, if you can get that in and get that placed within five days, um, that's great, but it's not as convenient. You have to call the doctor, you have to make an appointment, have the procedure, but that is most effective in um, preventing pregnancy. Um, okay, product selection. How the heck do we decide what we're gonna do? You really need to think about risk factors, obesity, drug interactions, effectiveness, um, you know, patient acceptability. Are they okay with inserting a ring every month? They may not be comfortable with that. Cost, um, adherence, um, are they breastfeeding, that kind of thing. And I want to show you real quick, you may have seen this, the CDC has some guidelines to help us with this, the medical eligibility criteria for contraceptive use. And they break this down, if you have a patient with different conditions, disease conditions, um, you can see in the far left, they have the condition. They even maybe have some sub-conditions here. And they break down all of the different options. Um, you have a copper IUD, the levonorgestrel IUD, an implant, the depo shot, progestin only, um, and combined hormonal contraceptives. And then they rate them based off the categories. One is the safest, four would be do not use at all. And so um, you can look here, you know, here's headaches. I do have a slide about the migraines, but okay, I have a patient with these migraines and um, they have an aura. Um, what would be the safest option? Um, all of these are green. The birth controls here, the combined hormonal contraceptives is a four. Um, you may not want to do that. You may want to do something else. But this is really handy if you have a patient that has several complications. Um, you can look this up. And that is just on the CDC website. Um, obesity, I talked about that briefly. It can change your pharmacokinetics half-life, time to steady state, bioavailability, all of that can change based off of a patient's weight. Um, there is conflicting data about this, so it's kind of confusing. Um, the majority of high quality studies um, did indicate that efficacy of COCs is not decreased with obesity. However, I did find something that said reduced efficacy can't be ruled out if you have a BMI greater than 30. So, 
what they recommend in these patients is making sure um, maybe that you're not using a patch, um, that you use an extended or a continuous cycle. And I think the thought behind that is you're eliminating that period where they don't have any hormone and you're kind of keeping more steady state concentrations. For whatever reason though, they do not recommend patches. Um, and again, you have to remember obesity in and of itself can increase our risk of thrombosis. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind too. Um, drug interaction, antibiotics used to be a huge thing when I was going through school, you know, 15 years ago. We would slap a label, a sticker on there with every penicillin I put out the door because I don't want people getting pregnant and taking their antibiotics. The CDC has really concluded that unless it's an enzyme inducing antibiotic, which would be like rifampin, um, it really, it does not affect the, or it does not impair the effectiveness of the birth control. So your penicillins and cephalosporins and all of those are fine with your birth control. Um, we hardly use rifampin, but if you have a patient on rifampin, then we would need to revisit this. Um, other enzyme inducing medications, things like anti-epileptic drugs, carbamazepine, there's a whole list there, um, HIV med, St. John's wort. Um, some of those are enzyme inducing and cause, can cause interactions. And what they recommend is using an IUD or a Depo-Provera shot. Um, another option that's not preferred is to go ahead and use um, an oral contraceptive but make sure they're using a barrier method as well. So two forms. That's not the preferred method, but it, it can be used. Um, so other issues, adherence. If you have a patient that's not adhering to anything, maybe think about your IUD, your implant, your shot, things that you don't have to do every single day, the patch once a week. Um, if you have a patient that's breastfeeding, let's not give them estrogen. Um, we can do an implant, the depo, progestin only pills. Um, if you have a smoker, we probably don't want to do estrogen, so progestin only. The migraine, I forget what your question was, but if you have a migraine with aura and without aura, it does depend on what you're doing. The migraine with aura, for whatever reason, we want to avoid estrogens. Um, that can increase the risk of stroke, and I, I don't know the science behind that, but for whatever reason, if your migraine patient has that aura, we don't want to give them estrogen. Um, and so if they do not have the aura, um, they do say you can use a little bit of estrogen as long as they have no other risk factors. So they're, they're under 35, they're not a smoker, they don't have hypertension. Um, but if it were me, I would probably just um, avoid it altogether. They do say that you can use the extended cycles or the continuous cycles in patients with migraines that have, you know, they're menstrual related. Um, it makes sense. You're having a period once a month, you're getting a migraine, you avoid the periods, you're not getting as many migraines. So. Um, Non-contraceptive benefits. Again, a lot of the options we talked about help reduce um, painful menstruation, endometriosis, in general, any birth control is going to help reduce painful menstruation, but you may have some patients that you know, have endometriosis. And so if you can eliminate periods altogether, that obviously is beneficial. Um, irregular cycles, putting them on a combined hormonal contraceptive can make their cycle more predictable. Um, but again, remind patients that it, it may take several months to get the full benefit and to get regulated. I wouldn't be worried about switching a, an oral contraceptive or anything for several months. I, I would wait and see how the patient does. Um, interuterine or heavy uterine bleeding, again, um, IUDs, things like that, that maybe are eliminating periods or reducing periods are all good options. Um, we can take things for PMS, um, acne, ovarian cysts, um, I want to make sure you guys have time for questions, so I'm going to kind of hang out here for just a minute. I have one other thing I want to show you. Um, I have a reference I would be happy to share um, and can make that available for you. I have a chart. I accessed this in February, but I can look for a more up-to-date one. Um, I have given this to my provider in the health center. This chart I love because it goes through and it breaks down what birth control and the name of the birth control, 
what it has in it, the manufacturer, it is super helpful. Um, I do not have them all memorized. I'll have girls call me up and say, oh, I'm on, you know, Strong's. And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> um, and I have to look it up. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and and I have providers calling me like, is, is this the right thing? Did it get filled? Um, and so I love this chart. It also is helpful because it breaks it down into, here we have all of our monophasic, you know, and you can see that it's increasing the amount of estrogen. We're starting out with 20, we're bumping up to 30, we're moving even further, all still under monophasic. Um, and then we can, here's our triphasics. Trisprintech is very common. You can see over here what I mean by a triphasic, it's changing the amount of hormone every week. Um, I would suggest getting a chart like this. Um, I access this off of the pharmacist letter. I use it for my CE. I don't know if any of you have used the provider, like the physician letter, prescriber's letter. I'm assuming it would also be on that too. Um, but I can, you know, send it to somebody and they can make that available. Um, but I do love it. Um, let's say you have a patient. I had talked earlier about you know, they, they don't have enough estrogen and they're experiencing spotting and you're like, well, I started them out here. Oh, I'm going to pick something from this category now. It, it just is a really nice chart um, to see it. Um, lastly, I want to say in the last lecture I did, I had students, I, I, doctors that are saying, okay, just give me some names of some that I can start out with. Um, I obviously don't prescribe it, but if it were me, I would probably start with a monophasic. Um, I also would probably start with maybe a third generation. You look at that chart. Um, Drospirinone was in that. Dinogest was in that. Or even in other class, the anti-androgenic. Because I don't want to mess with someone calling me and saying, I've got acne. You know, oh, I've got spotting. So if it were me personally, and I don't have any other risk factors, let me find, I would probably hang out here in this chart. Um, desogesterone, third generation, 30 micrograms of estrogen, a pre. So a pre would be one that I can write for. Probably not going to have a lot of, you know, spotting and that kind of thing. Again, it is kind of an art form. You may have to just start somewhere and, and go from there. Another one, this drospirinone, um, Yaz, Yasmin, not Yaz, Yasmin is popular, Ocella, all of the names for that. Um, I would probably do that. A pre, yes. Um, Sprintech is very common. That's a third generation, has a little bit more estrogen. Um, I would probably start there and then just see what happens. Um, again, I, I don't know all the ins and outs of your patients. As long as there's no other issues, I would just go from there. Okay, I want to make sure you guys have times for questions. Time for questions. <laughs> It does not, which would be good. I can make that androgenic. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. I can give that to you. Um, here, this is helpful. So this, um, this third generation is really, they don't have as much androgen receptor activity. So again, the norgestimate, desogesterol, those are not as much androgenic. And this other class has the anti. So that chart doesn't necessarily spell it out, but if I make that available, you can cut it and label it on there, or maybe I can even put that on that chart and send it or something, because this chart is really helpful as well. So yeah, sure. I will make sure you guys have access to that. What else? Well, that's it. I didn't, hopefully didn't keep you too late. I think we were an hour was our limit maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so anything else? Any other questions, things that I didn't go into? Oh. I know it can be really confusing. Um, it still confuses me a lot, a lot of times when you just get the name. I mean, as you scroll through this, it is very overwhelming because there are so many different types. Um, and they are all basically the same thing. So um, I will definitely make sure you have this. 
Um, and don't be afraid to call the pharmacy. I mean, make friends with your pharmacist. I love to help. So, I mean, if somebody has a question, I'm like, oh, good, I get to, I get to do something. Um, so, you know, if you have a question, what? <laughs> don't say that. No, I love it. I love when, when they call me. You can either find me at three different pharmacies. Like, hey, are you Sandy, the one that gave me that talk? <laughs> um, but that's all I have. Thank you guys for listening to me jabber and have a good day.